Welcome to the Harold B. Lee Library's House of Learning Lecture Series. I'm Mike Hunter, the coordinator for this year's lecture series. In the Doctrine and Covenants section 88 verse 119, it says, organize yourselves and establish a house, even a house of faith, a house of learning. Through this, this lecture series, the Harold B. Lee Library seeks to establish a house of learning by bringing students and scholars together for a discussion of ideas. We are privileged to have as our featured speaker today, Professor Matthew Wickman from BYU's Department of English. Professor Wickman came to BYU after earning his PhD at UCLA in 2000. He is Associate Professor of English and College Professor of Humanities at BYU and also Senior Lecturer of Scottish Literature at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Widely published in Scottish Literary and Intellectual History, he is the author of the book The Ruins of Experience, Scotland's Romantic Highlands and the Birth of the Modern Witness. Please join with me in welcoming Professor Whitman. Thank you for, uh, for being here on a fairly balmy November afternoon. It's a pleasure to see you. Um, before I forget, I wanna, I wanna say, uh, first of all, that this talk here marks just about the near conclusion of the Burns exhibit that we've had uh, going on the third floor, the main floor of the library. If you haven't seen it yet, I hope you'll go uh, look at it. And I wanna thank some people about that who've been involved in the exhibit. Russ Taylor, whose idea initially it was to have this exhibit. Uh, Maggie Kopp and her staff. Maggie curates the Burns exhibit and does a wonderful job with this. Um, and who helped put the exhibit together, helped write labels on the cases. Um, thanks to Sean McMurdy and his staff who designed the layout for the exhibit and did a beautiful job putting it together. Thanks to Scott Duvall, the Library Administration, who have sponsored some wonderful lecturers, speakers from outside the university uh, who have come. And lastly, thanks to Mike Hunter for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'll just jump right in. Uh, traditional cultural histories tell us that literature emerged in its modern conceptual form as imaginative writing during the 19th century. It did so purportedly as a reaction against industrialization, but also as a reflection of it. Partly, that is, as an assertion of creative human energy set against the mechanization of labor and society, but partly as a consequence of the logic of mechanization in the scientific subdivision of knowledge into the shape of our modern disciplines. Literature became a human pursuit in an increasingly inhuman world. Now, this isn't a bad story, but in some ways it's grown stale. And so, I wish to think today about the relation between the human and the inhuman, literature and the sciences, and especially mathematics. I'll do so by a discussion of Robert Burns, who's on the screen right there who became an immensely popular poet almost from the instant his first volume of poems appeared in 1786. However, it was during the decades after his death in 1796 that Burns emerged as a global icon, which is LeBron James's dream. Uh, a series of editors, critics, biographers elevated Burns into a national symbol and then into something even more abstract, something like the personification of an idealized past and an idyllic though desolate Scottish landscape, a sanctuary of feeling. Heralded in his own era as the plowman poet, Burns now became instead the emblem of a vanishing peasantry and the oracle of supposedly timeless human values. Societies and clubs sprang up all over the world in Burns' name and to honor his memory. I find this image funny. It's a Burns poem, it's a late 19th century version, edition, of Burns' poem, The Cotter Saturday Night, which shows angels praying around the, 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 the book of poems open. I, I, this is an example of how Burns was sort of sentimentalized and really um, uh, sensationalized. Um, scholars translated Burns of Scott's vernacular into dozens of languages. He became, in many ways, the world's best known and most beloved literary figure. And yet, despite all this, or perhaps because of it, Burns' re reputation steadily declined in academic circles, especially in the middle decades of the 20th century. In a recent book, Murray Pittock documents the virtual disappearance of Burns from scholarly journals, university press books, and literary anthologies after the 1930s. The sheer strangeness of this is visible on a number of levels, Pittock remarks. For example, Burns' poetry exists in more than 50 languages. He acquired a significant following after the 1930s in places like Russia and China, and his work and legacy annually helped generate about a quarter of a billion dollars in tourism. 
Uh, and ultimately, the reasons for Burns' disappearance from scholarly consciousness have more to do with the evolution of the field of Romanticism than they do with Burns, involving in part the drift of literary criticism and theory from Britain to the continent, and especially to Germany, a process substantially enabled by late 19th and early 20th century Scottish intellectuals who played key roles in the translation of German ideas for the English-speaking world via editions of Kant, Hegel, and Heidegger. The Fisher is this tectonic shift introduced into our understanding of romantic categories like genius and imagination are fascinating and worthy of discussion on their own, but I want to focus instead on what Pittock calls the strangeness of Burns' disappearance, the strangeness made visible of Burns hiding in plain sight, incomprehension of the obvious, the strangeness of the visible is a widespread phenomenon in the modern world. Science conditions us to believe that we rarely understand things, machines, objects in nature, other people, simply by looking at them. In effect, science opens our eyes to what we cannot see beneath the surface and blinds us to what we can. This is a condition, according to Pittock, which the Burnsian legacy exemplifies, making Burns in some ways the quintessential poet of the modern age. The logic of this modern, strangely visible Burns is the subject of my talk. I begin by focusing on something disconcertingly visible in one of Burns' most famous poems, To a Louse. Ha! Where you gone, you crawling fairly, you crawling wonder, the poet cries. Your impudence protects you surly. I cannot say what you stunt rarely or gauze and lace, though faith I fear you dine but sparely on sick a place. The poet sitting in a church service has fixed his eyes on a louse perched atop an attractive lady's fashionable and very large headwear. He's disgusted by the sight. You ugly, creeping, blasted wonner, detested, shunned by saint and sinner. How dare you set your foot upon her, say, fine a lady. Go somewhere else and seek your dinner on some poor body. Lice on ladies seem as misplaced as high fashion in church. Of course, it occurs to the poet that, however ungainly the associations may be, both louse and lady pretentiously set their noses out. And so, after addressing the louse for several more stanzas, the poet concludes with this more general and unsettling plea. Oh, would some power the gifty geas to see ourselves as others see us, it would from money a blunder free us and foolish notion. What airs in dress and gait would lead us, and even devotion. If we saw ourselves the way others see us, we would cease all affectation. We would pretend neither to high society nor to high and mighty religiosity. At one level, Burns's poem was about hypocrisy about how people are often something other than what they purport to be. The poet's lament applies as readily to himself as it does to the lady. Indeed, he's something of a louse himself, given that his voracious gaze betrays his own desire to devour her. Fittingly, he seems not to recognize this. He cannot see himself as we see him. Rather, in philosophizing about how we are creatures of impulse rather than understanding, the poet himself speaks impulsively. He thus enacts the opacity which he describes. Now, Burns has crafted a very clever poem here, a poem not only about hypocrisy, but also about the problem of self-reflection and the conundrum this problem presents for our conception of human nature. If we as humans are rational creatures, pardon me, if we as humans, as rational animals, are creatures of impulse rather than understanding, of instinct rather than reason, then we resemble the nature over which we lord. We may not exactly be vermin, no matter how much some lice resemble some poets or some ladies, but to exalt ourselves above the natural creation on the basis of a rational faculty we do not fully possess would be an inhuman, which is to say, an irrational, unself-reflective gesture. And conversely, to recognize our inhumanity, to see ourselves as we really are, would be to rationalize our irrationality, which would be a contradiction. 
we are thus caught between the categories through which we define our being. Our humanity attests to our inhumanity, and vice versa. This paradox was a centerpiece of Scottish Enlightenment, or Scottish 18th century, moral philosophy. David Hume, Adam Smith, and others argued that passion, impulsive energy, was the driving force behind familial and civic societies, national and religious identities, and commerce and the wealth of nations. Of course, to reason about the primacy of passion only compounded the problem of self-reflection. If philosophy is driven by impulse, then that philosophy must be impulsive in order for it to be true. This places philosophy, a deliberative discipline, in, the, in an untenable position, which may explain why supernatural agencies occasionally enter these texts at key moments to account for what no mere philosopher ever could. The most famous instance of deus ex machina in these texts occurs in Smith's account of the mechanism of the market, which is driven not only by needs for subsistence, but also by our desire for luxuries. The market's an impulsive mechanism to Smith. In Smith's analysis, the economy is an elaborate edifice fueled by consumer impulse and shaped by entrepreneurial reflection, a formulation not unlike William Wordsworth's conception of poetry as the producer of powerful feelings recollected or reorganized in comparative tranquility. Accordingly, when Smith finds he cannot explain why this complex menagerie of human impulse does not descend into chaos, he essentially resorts to poetry, ascribing economic stability to the invisible hand of providence. To be sure, nobody sees this hand, nobody literally sees this hand, and Smith's rhetorical figure actually seems most aptly to personify his extensive philosophical apparatus. After all, it was not providence per se that Smith desired to see, but rather the market system, which is not visible as such. One may behold laborers and commodities and stores, but not the commercial system as an abstract entity. Smith's poetic figure, the invisible hand, is thus a trope which, along with other less overt tropes like credit or bonds or interest, shapes how we perceive and understand those items which we actually can see, like laborers and commodities and stores. As the intellectual historian Mary Poovey argues, figures like the invisible hand reveal that theories like Smith's entail a system of belief which informs what we see as well as how we interpret what we see. Indeed, there is no observation outside of belief. What Poovey implies is that all understanding of abstract systems is essentially providential. What we know about markets and space and life forms is essentially um, probably is a function of invisible hands, meaning linguistic figures and theories, which serve as the instruments of a kind of secular faith. Here, the human and the natural sciences collapse into literature in that they too necessarily traffic in tropes, that imagination and experiment are one is a principle of nanotechnology, as it is of novels. But this reintroduces the Burnsian problem of self-reflection. If we must craft the frameworks through which we interpret our data, then we essentially condition our understanding through tropes which, preceding understanding, function as impulses. In short, modern science speaks before it thinks, inevitably so. Traditionally, Western thought has sought to circumvent the problem of figurative language of tropological impulse via mathematics, whose geometrical shapes and numerical figures represent a coincidence of what we see and what we think. A circle, for example, is not an object in the world, but rather an invention of the mind, equivalent to its own definition as, here's the definition, a plain figure bounded by a single curved line called the circumference, which is everywhere equally distant from a point within called the center. To think a circle in this way is thus to grasp what a circle actually is, 
even if this thing is only in the mind and does not correspond with actual objects in the world. To see geometrically, then, is to see things as they really are. This seems to be the assumption made by Franco Moretti, an influential scholar who is currently attempting to redefine literary history. His 2005 book, Graphs, Maps, Trees, lays out the program of what he calls world literature on the basis of geometric patterns of literary development. For example, visually charted rates of 18th and early 19th century novel production and the quantitative rise and fall of narrative forms like the Gothic novel. Geometrical patterns, he says, are too orderly to be the product of chance. They are the sign that something is at work here, that something has made these patterns the way they are. What these patterns reveal, Moretti believes, are the striking similarities between diverse literary traditions, divulging resemblances which are so uncanny that they revise all our conventional cause and effect histories about how individual traditions came to be, displacing agency from authors or world events to something more elusive. What Moretti desires here, essentially, is to see the impulses of human nature. And the figures by which he sees are not tropes like Smith's invisible hand, but rather shapes, graphs, maps, trees. Now Moretti's approach would befuddle a philosopher like Alain Badiou. Less in its adoption of methods associated with mathematics and the sciences than in Moretti's belief that his models are geometric. The sciences, Badiou contends, and indeed all aspects of modern thought and society, are dominated not by geometric shapes, but rather by numbers. We live in the era of numbers despotism, Badiou proclaims. What counts in the sense of what is valued is that which is counted. Politics operates according to polls, turnouts, majorities. Statistics invade the entire domain of the human sciences. We calculate markets and expect citizens to be cognizant of foreign trade figures, of the flexibility of the exchange rate, and of fluctuations in stock prices. Indeed, he says, number informs our very souls. What is it to exist, he concludes, if not to give a favorable account of oneself? Moretti's supposedly geometric patterns, for example, are essentially fractals, or statistics accorded visual representation. Numbers are the essence of which graphs, maps, and trees are merely the expression. But for Badiou, this still begs the question of what numbers are, a question for which, he says, we possess no coherent answer. Whole numbers, negative numbers, rational numbers, real numbers, complex numbers, ordinals, cardinals, these are the diverse and irreconcilably different numerical systems through which we imagine and organize our existences. What is more, Kurt Gödel's famous incompleteness theorems show that even individual numerical systems cannot account for themselves, let alone other systems. What makes this a serious situation in Badiou's estimation is that if we don't know what numbers are, we don't know who we are. We don't know what it means to exist as a unified being, essentially, as one whole number, or even what it means to exist as a rational, real, or complex being or number, which is to say, as some agglomerate of fragmentary cells or neurological impulses. What is Moretti's mathematically derived world literature, after all, if we do not know what the numbers which anchor it mean, and therefore do not know who we ourselves are, who find ourselves represented in it? Indeed, we do not see ourselves in the ideal forms or geometric patterns of our being, Badiou you might say, because these forms are actually numbers and incoherent numbers at that. And yet, the attraction of visual heuristics like graphs, maps, and trees attest to the opacity of numbers, to their failure to convey meaning unless we sketch them as forms. And so, and so it seems, forms are numbers 
but numbers themselves are little more than the empty shells of our being, the ruins of our self-understanding. Now, enough about, numbers, the number, uh, enough about numbers for a moment. I'm a literature person. I like stories. And what drives me to, drives me to this drama between Moretti, a literary scholar, and Badiou, a philosopher, is a story it tells about how, got to think sort of large historical thoughts here, about how humanists seeking enlightenment began venturing into the comparatively inhuman mathematical frontiers of their discipline, turning from texts and reading to geometric patterns and seeing, only to encounter at the climax of their quest an impenetrable numerical heart of darkness. Uh, parenthetically, Kurtz's famous last words in Conrad's novella, Heart of Darkness, the horror, that also capture my experience sitting in high school math classes. Uh, just true. Uh, but there's a second story here which involves Burns. Specifically, the rupture Burns describes in Tua Laos between perception and understanding, a tale like the one Pittock tells of strange visibility. Burns himself names, or Burns himself frames the tension between the categories of form and number, which Moretti and Badiou introduce in his famous poem, To a Mouse. The poet, you may recall, has run over a mouse's nest with his plow, and he's moved to address the creature as he watches it scurry, expressing sorrow that man's dominion has broken nature's social union. Uh, reflections made all the more poignant in his recognition that man and mouse are alike subject to the forces of nature and that the best laid schemes of mice and men gang off to glay or go off to ride. The poet nevertheless observes that the two parties are of a different order of being. Uh, Thou art blessed compared with me, he tells the mouse in the final stanza. The present only toucheth thee, but oh, I backward cast my e on prospects drear. And forward, though I cannot see, I guess and fear. The poem concludes by drawing these essential contrasts. The mouse lives eternally in the present, whereas human existence suspends itself between past and future. The mouse dwells amidst the world of objects, straw, soil, barley, while humans occupy a realm of spirits, of haunting absences and pseudo-presences. The mouse's existence is tangible, the plowman's atmospheric. The mouse is an organism of earth, the plowman a creature of heaven, or more properly, of the environment, as that which literally environs or surrounds him, dividing him both from what is materially at hand and also from himself. The plowman poet cannot see himself for who he is for he's perpetually estranged from self-understanding. Now, Burns wrote this poem to dramatize the breakdown of sympathy, which was one of the most important theories to emerge from 18th century Scotland, explaining, as it did, how societies cohere and why they take the forms they do. It was in his treatise on sympathy, significantly, that Adam Smith developed the concept of the invisible hand, which he would later evoke to explain the workings of the market in the wealth of nations. Basically, sympathy is a theory of acculturation or socialization. More technically, it explains how a multiple number of persons come to share a common viewpoint, or how many become one. Burns's poem, however, essentially makes Badiou's point. Not only do man and mouse fail to unite, not only do two fail to become one, but the one itself, the poet, the human is internally divided and thus incoherent. So what Burns sketches in place of a unified being is a distributed ontology linking diverse elements. Neither nature nor human being in the poem are one, are simply themselves, dispersed as they are across heaven and earth, past and future, here and there, in fungible or alternating sets of relations. The conventional term for di such distributed ontology is the word network, which designates configurations that take different forms depending on how we define them. Burns's famous plow, for example, makes up diverse networks 
we might define it as a tool composed of blade, handles, and hitch. Or we might read this plow as an index of 18th century agricultural practices during an era of industrialization, hence as a kind of historical relic linking farmland to cities. Or we might regard the plow as an icon of Burns's reputation as the plowman poet, hence as a poetic symbol bringing together poet, print capitalism, and a global readership. Now, the romantic critic William Hazlitt once uh, uh, made this connection when he gushed once that Burns held the plow or the pen with the same firm, manly grasp. Which I, I love that. Uh, I think that's very funny. Right? Uh, anyway, um, so the plow, is it a tool? Is it a symbol of changing agriculture? Is it a poetic symbol? Um, how we see Burns's plow, in effect, is a function of how we configure its constituent elements. To what is the plow connected? Just its own parts, or to agriculture, or to the whole print industry? Network theories typically devolve on the mathematical practice of topology, sometimes described as geometry on a rubber pad. Topology defines space as sets of relations rather than distances, relations which persist even when the medium on or through which they are inscribed stretches, folds, or otherwise morphs. Hence the idea of topology is jumping rubber pad, like you know, the space bends like this. Well, the words on the page remain the same words, but the space bends that way to accommodate right, this more fluid medium. Crucially, topology consists of both Moretti's geometry and Badiou's numbers. Its shapes derive from the lines we trace between coordinates on a graph. Not coincidentally, topology and, by extension, network theories figure prominently in the nebulous zone between the humanities and the sciences as the model of all modern systems, economic, historical, literary, biological, and so on. All systems, argues the French theorist Michel Serres, consist of points and lines, beings and relations in perpetual rearrangement. Burns's plow, the global economy, the war on terror, these and indeed all configurations change their shape and thus their meaning with the introduction of new circumstances, new information. Serres has an interesting way of describing the effects of any intervening or shape-shifting agency which modifies an existing network. He calls these things parasites. Parasites pervade our world, he argues. We cannot escape them or their effects inasmuch as they represent the basis of all change, of anything new happening and altering the network of our existence. This is true, he says, of all beings and systems. It is a tale of lice and men. It's a quote from Serres. It's a tale of lice and men. Uh, Serres alludes here to the French translations of Burns' famous companion poems to a mouse and to a louse. Burns is the iconic poet, for Serres, of topological parasitism. Take the poem To a Louse, for instance, which, like To a Mouse, bases itself directly on the idea of failed sympathy. The louse and the lady comprise a kind of shared being in that both right baldly stick their noses out, but the poet and the louse also bear a relation to each other and that they, and that each in his way, wishes to feast on the lady. No creature here sees itself as others see it, but each exists as a kind of network, one which we may graph. Consider first the poem's two penultimate stanzas. Uh, I would not have been surprised to spy you, the poet says to the louse, on an old wife's flanen toy, or Ablin's, perhaps, some bit duddy boy on his wild coat. But Mrs. Fine Lunardi, her hat, fie, how dare you do it? Oh, Jenny, do not toss your head and set your beauties ah, bread. You little can, you don't know what cursed speed the blast he's making. They winks and finger ends I dread are no taken. At its simplest level, to a louse crafts a triangular relationship here between, uh, in the middle triangle, sort of poet, uh, louse, and woman, middle triangle there. The poet addresses the louse, 
The louse is focused upon the woman as he makes cursed speed down her bonnet, and the woman's attention is implicitly directed outward toward the congregation by whom she wishes to be seen in her fine hat, and, who direct, uh, and, and the people who direct at her winks and wagging finger ends. This vague outward gaze of the ladies underscores the wider network of congregation and minister, and this is the triangle on the right, presumably beholding one another with the minister thus taking in the woman and the poet. The poet and the woman thus each find themselves in two positions, two networks, if you will, simultaneously, as part of the congregation gathered for a church service and as key players in a drama built around them which has nothing to do with conventional worship. This is the hypocrisy of which I spoke earlier. The players in this drama are more or other than what they appear to be. And the crucial medium of this ribald drama, Burns's lilting vernacular language, reminds us in turn that there is still a larger network at play here in the poetic reticulum of Scott's speakers, Burns's global readership, and his poetic precursors like Alan Ramsey and Robert Ferguson. And this is a triangle on the left-hand side. When we configure the poem in this way, we implicitly reveal a crucial historical moment in the drama which Moretti and Badiou unfold, the drama of shape and its dissolution into the incoherence of number. In 1735, the Swiss, the Swiss mathematician Leonhard Euler devised an alternative mode of mathematical reasoning as a way of resolving growing tensions between geometry and algebra. Uh, this is a algebraic treatise, okay? During the 18th century, algebra was an ascendant discipline, especially in the sciences. It enabled much more precise numerical measurements of things like distances, speeds, likelihoods, and shifting variables. Geometry, however, was the classical language of mathematics, and it remained preeminent in Scotland, where literati predicated their university traditions and even their newer theories of cognition on geometric principles of rationality ideality of shape, visibility of relations, and so on. Algebra was a comparatively sublime or obscure exercise. It produced verifiable results, but in a way which defied the mind's ability to trace these results experientially, visually, geometrically. The 19th century Scottish mathematician William Hamilton created a vivid analogy through which to explain the difference between these mathematical approaches. The algebraic method, he said, is like running a railroad through a tunneled mountain. The geometric method, by contrast, is like crossing the mountain on foot. The algebraic carries us by a short and easy transit to our desired point, but in miasma, darkness, whereas the geometric allows us to reach it only after time and trouble, but feasting us at each turn with glances of the earth and of the heavens, while we inhale health in the pleasant breeze and gather new strength at every effort we put forth. Geometry, Hamilton implied, was the language of philosophical truth. However, it was algebra which permitted mathematicians to entertain new concepts like irrational and negative numbers and to develop important new theories like the calculus, which would prove so instrumental to the applied sciences. Back momentarily to Euler, who sought to fuse the classical to the new science, geometry, to algebra. He called his resolution of this dilemma the geometry of position, a model in which space and number were convertible into one another. He illustrated how it functions through a famous example involving the seven bridges of Königsberg, a city in Eastern Prussia. This is the map of Königsberg with the bridges and the little blue glyphs there are the, are the bridges. Um, the seven bridges connecting four land masses formed a puzzle about whether it be possible to walk around the city crossing each bridge only once. Ideally, the flaneur or the walker would return to the point from which he or she started. Rather than trying to work through each possible route separately, Euler simplified the problem by relating the number of land masses to the number of bridges and by creating a formula for how these relationships would operate. He concluded that, and I'm quoting Euler here, if there are more than two areas as to which an odd number of bridges lead, then such a journey is possible. If, however, the number of bridges is odd for exactly two areas, then the journey is possible if it starts in either of these two areas. If, finally, there are no areas which, to which an odd number of bridges lead, then the required journey can be accomplished starting from any area 
okay, right. The formula here is less interesting to me than what became of it later. All right, the formula itself, it's interesting, but it's not the main point. Early 19th century mathematicians like Louis Poinceau would further refine Euler's invention by reducing the land masses to a set of vertices, thus laying the foundations for modern graph theory and, drum roll please, topology. Now it's on, this is here's the, the transformation right there, those three, you know, from land masses to nodes to vertices. It's unlikely that Burns knew anything about the puzzle of the seven bridges of Königsberg, or more generally about Euler's geometry of position. And yet, in To a Laos, the alleged failure of sympathy actually enables not only an Eulerian path around the various nodes of positional poetic objects, but also potentially an Eulerian circuit in which we complete a successful path at the same position where we began. I refer again to the image of adjacent triangles, to the three networks and correspondence spheres of the poem, specifically those of action, situation, and conventional framework. The middle triangle in the diagram involves the poet, louse, and woman, the one on the right, the situational context, in this case, the poem's location in the church service, and the one on the left, the framework in which the poem appears as a poem, which is read, consumed as a poem. It's possible here, on strictly positional grounds, to trace an Eulerian circuit moving, the po moving from poet who addresses the louse, who sits atop the lady's bonnet, and you kind of follow this with the arrows? That's the idea, at least. I had a student uh, who's much better at graphics than I am put these together. I couldn't do better than this. this is a, anyway, thanks to Megan Rowley for these slides. Um, um, so starting again from Poe, addresses the louse, sits up to the lady's bonnet, then from there to the congregation of whom she is conscious, to the minister to whom they are all listening, and then back to the lady, who the minister sees as part of the congregation, then to the poet, whom the minister sees gazing at the lady, and then from there to the precursors of whom the poet is conscious as a poet, then to the reading public for whom those precursors wrote, and then to the poet whom these readers presently engage. The circuit here shows how Burns's poem, for all its failed sympathy, achieves a kind of geometric balance and measure. If we go one step further, and treat the poem as a topological matrix, as later mathematicians would do with Euler's model, these relationships become even more interesting. There are several forms a topologically derived shape can take, but in this instance here, with the three spheres folded over each other, we see through distinct positions and thus get a different perspective, a kind of geometric perspective, onto the hypocrisy which Burns renders thematic, or onto the way in which things are more than just themselves, more than just one. The poet in this illustration shares a positional place with the minister, with the imputation that each means something other than what he says. Precursors like Ramsey and Ferguson, meanwhile, assume the diagrammatic position of the lady, which is interesting in that the poet effectively gazes on his precursors, changing how his reading public will perceive them much like he alters our perception of the louse-infested fashionista. All these figures here, poet, precursors, lady, all of them, assume a kind of multiple being which corresponds with Burns' theme of failed sympathy, with our inability to see ourselves as others see us. But that failure is a function less of myopia than of ontological complexity. In seeing ourselves, we see too much. This is the principle of strange visibility, strung through network theory, which underscores the creaturely, human and inhuman, nature of subjects and objects, the degree to which man and mouse, poet and plow, are bound to one another. Now, we could stop here by proclaiming Burns. Uh, this actually appeared in the newspaper, The Scotsman. I liked it because of the kind of the, the hipster Burns. We could proclaim Burns the poet prophet of postmodernity, uh, the one who disappeared from scholarly consciousness after the 1930s, or precisely when, reputedly, the notion of a coherent human subject fragmented into a mass of selves and impulses. Uh, it's postmodern truism, right? That the self is composed of fragments, right? Fragments that we are too much, we are too complex. Burns vanished from view, in other words, we might say when a traditional notion of the human itself decomposed, 
and when, perhaps seeking refuge from that spectacle, a field like British Romanticism turned instead to the self-absorbed lyricism of a Wordsworth, or the transcendental detachment of a Kant, or eventually, for that matter, to a grand project of reunification, like Moretti's world literature. But the problem with this image of a postmodern Burns, Badiou might remind us, is that the type of ontological incoherence from which it derives actually has a much longer history dating back to the early modern and enlightenment epics, which is to say, to the era of the dissolution of metaphysics and numerical oneness, when the advent of negative numbers and irrational numbers and infinitesimals rendered every mathematical formulation incomplete in Gödel's terminology, or converted mathematics into fiction, a literature person like myself might say. To speak of two, or of 2x, or of 2i, when we do not know what 2 means, is effectively to convert all numbers into invisible hands, or tropes, which enable us to put our faith in them and use them even when we cannot fully explain them. Essentially, then, to speak of numbers in modernity, whether in mathematics, or in the sciences, or in economics, is to wax poetical. But would this be Burns's poetry? I'm thinking here of the Scottish geometers of Burns's era. This is one of them, Colin McLaren, 18th century Scottish geometer. And of their desire to circumvent the paradoxes of number and, and algebra by creating figures which consisted in pure relations and which thus purported to obviate the tropology of numbers and especially of algebraic symbols in which x functions as a signifier for some quantity other than itself, right? x equals 3 or x equals whatever. For Burns's peers, these were figures of sight rather than speech. These were shapes rather than tropes purporting to capture the literal motions of the mind. In effect, this was modern psychology or perhaps phenomenology, the philosophy of experience dressed up as Euclidean geometry, which is why its nearest corollary is probably that cadre of early 20th century avant-garde artists who were so drawn to geometry and to experiments of spatial form. I'm speaking here of the Mondrians and the Duchamps and the so-called vortographs of Alvin Langdon Coburn. This one of the poet Ezra Pound. It's not out of focus. That's the nature of the vortograph. Um, all of which idealized images of worlds which very much are, but which usually escape our purview. Burns would have most appealed to these artists precisely when he disappeared from scholarly consciousness, even as his global audience grew. Precisely, in other words, when he became most strangely visible. Now, thinking of the avant-garde by way of Burns and his 18th century Scottish contemporaries would change our view of modernism, of when it emerged, and why, and how. Uh, this slide here is a 19th century image of the Burns Monument, Burns's home of air. I love the kind of the contorted, twisted, sort of gothic shapes here. But thinking about modernism in this expanded way would also inspire some interesting questions about the relationship between literature and mathematics the less about the reduction of numbers to tropes than about the varieties of images poems create. What would it mean, both conceptually and historically, to imagine a poem or any piece of literature not as a puzzle of signs, but instead as a constellation of spatial figures? What would it mean, that is, to read literature not by way of algebra, with its linguistic logic of symbolic substitution, of signs for reference, but instead to see it through geometry with its model of spatial relations. Indeed, what might it mean to conceive of a line of poetry? Thank you. <laughs>